How many of you paid your sidewalk provider in order to come here? You didn't because sidewalks, though they're expensive to build, are free to use, and that's what makes cities work. Yet when it comes to something so fundamental as our ability to communicate, we accept the idea that we depend on providers who must make a profit, who tell us how many words we're allowed to use, sometimes even what words we're allowed to use, and if you have a provider, the provider can deny, deny us the ability to speak. And we accept that, but for millennia, we've been used to giving our messages to the postal workers, to telegraph operators, to phone companies, who carry the message like precious and expensive cargo. But I'm a tinkerer and a programmer. I look at the wires, the radios, and I see how much more potential there is in, in the infrastructure. And the internet itself hints at some of this. I remember once pro, uh, parting late. Of course, I'm a nerd, so really we're programming late. <laughs> <laughs> and we went out for breakfast and wanted to get some French toast. The chef said, we're out of French toast. We asked, are you out of eggs? Are you out of milk? Are you out of bread? He, each time he said no. Admitted he didn't know the recipe for French toast. <laughs> so, of course, being programmers, we gave him the software, the recipe, and we had a fine breakfast. And that's really what software is. It's just a recipe that can take on a life of its own. Now, I had the fortune of getting into programming very early when things were very simple. The programs themselves were put on a piece of cardboard, punched cards. You can actually see the holes. You can see the wires in the computer. It's all very simple. And that was a very important starting point because I can see how everything worked. Yet by 1966, while I was still in high school, I was already working on helping to build one of the first online financial information systems. It was a very complex system, but I didn't forget my roots. I knew how we went from the simple steps to the complex systems, and we had to do everything ourselves, like build our own networks. And that's been a valuable experience because I know how to build this. I know we can rebuild it. But one other important experience from the time is I took home a computer terminal. And in August 1966, I was able to work from home. Of course, I had to do my job work, but I was free to do anything else I wanted with that million dollar computer. It became a personal computer that can use to do homework assignments, I can exchange email half a century ago, and I can discover the future that I couldn't imagine. I was living the future just by exploring it. If you can imagine it, it's just more of, the, more of the same, more of the present. Eventually, I found myself at MIT, which is a fun place, because I can explore all sorts of interesting, interesting ideas, learn how people learn, how they communicate. We studied the phone system as just another computer. But one class I was in was at the nexus of change. We were studying a network in Hawaii, a radio network, and it, it, it was just computers, there was no provider, and each message was split up into little fragments called packets, and each one was numbered. So you can send the packet on the radio, and sometimes it'll get there, sometimes not. But of course, for programs, that's not a big deal. You program around it. If the packet didn't get there, you can retransmit it. And that took a, a, a network. Well, it really wasn't a network because there's no provider, but it made it act like a network, and that's what's important. And you know, we were able to use it for standard network functions. So I didn't appreciate how revolutionary that idea was, but we had inverted the paradigm of engineering. Instead of depending on layers and adding value, we had an unreliable base and everything was a resource. Now, some people did appreciate the value. They were asked to do a project to interconnect the existing networks, an inter-networking effort. And the insight they had was that if they didn't have to solve problems in the network, they didn't have to worry about translating between all the networks and getting things to work together. All they needed was anybody in the middle just to put the best efforts in to move the packets along. And that experiment worked far better than they could have imagined. I don't know how many of you know, know the name of this. It's called the internet. <laughs> A very pragmatic solution that worked far better than, than they realized because it created opportunity. So Tim Berners-Lee in a basement room could just create the web because it provided available resources. Now, I like the idea of playing and tinkering. So as soon as personal computers became available, I started playing with them. My main friend friends didn't understand why I was excited about having a device I owned and it could even break. 
But when Dan Bricklin asked me to help him with his project, the first electronic spreadsheet, I jumped at the opportunity. If nothing else, it would be a lot of fun. What we did, though, was create opportunity for others to explore. You no longer had to explain what you want to do to a programmer. You no longer had to spend all the time on the details. And you didn't have to sell for a program that did one thing. People were able to explore and work in their element, in a sense, in the native language of finance. The most users just disappeared, and they're working in the moment. Now, one byproduct of VisiCalc was it gave me standing and a lot of freedom at Microsoft. I had an office in Seattle, but I generally worked in Boston. So I don't ask permission, so I just called my, my home the Boston Area Research Facility. <laughs> okay, I don't have to explain what FARF meant. And of course, all my computers are networked. But the problem is, those are days you would dial up to make each connection. And I remember the lesson of the networking effort. I want to interconnect my home network with the rest of the world. I didn't want to access the internet, because my home is just as much the internet as anybody else. I wanted to join and connect. Now, the phone companies had an exciting new thing they called broadband. So instead of running a wire every time you want a new phone line, they would just add a service. And what was wonderful for them was they would pretend they were charging for a new phone line. They would charge you for each phone number. They would charge you for each television. They even would charge you for every purchase you made because they were in the middle and they can do that. That was their dream. They charged monthly fees for each personal computer. If you got two computers, you had two fees. And it didn't make sense to me because I was creating all the services. I knew everything was a packet. I was creating the, the value myself. And just to illustrate that, at one point, the phone company was hooking up a, a new phone wire, and they were puzzled. There was a, a dial tone on the line. How many of you remember dial tones? Uh, and they weren't generating a dial tone. It was coming from inside my house. I was generating the dial tone. Things were reversed. <laughs> and because I was at Microsoft, I took the approach I took, which was to put what now familiar router at the edge of my house, so all my computers, phone company couldn't see past that. They just thought I had one device, and that was that. And I reversed the pipe. Now, that was just a tunnel to the rest of the network. The phone companies were not part of the conversation. And AT&T, which paid a lot of money to become my cable company, sold it off at a loss to Comcast. Now, because I was at Microsoft, I did put the support into Windows, and that's the familiar home network you have now. That's why when you buy a new printer, you buy a new device, you're not paying a monthly fee, at least not within your house. When you leave your house, things change. But to understand what was really going on, we call an incident in 1998. I was in New York visiting my mother, and she bought a red toy dump truck at Radio Shack and wanted to send it to her grandson in Seattle. She came to me, Robert, of course I was Robert, but her. Can you send this to Seattle? I said, sure, it'll be there in one hour. Now, I assume she thinks I'm a magician, but she believed me. <laughs> but if she'd gone to the post office, of course, she would have taken the post office, they would have put in a, a box, it would have shipped on a truck, eventually get to Seattle at a high cost and everything. But I did get it in there in one hour. I returned the, the toy she bought, sent the part number to my brother in Seattle, and he bought the same toy there. So my nephew had the same toy my mother bought within an hour. The key thing to realize that was the very same toy my mother bought. If you quibble about that, you're choosing scarcity. But the secret to Moore's law, hypergrowth, is to find success in what you can do, find value any way you can, not to restrict yourself to arbitrary or preconceived notions. Now, if you think about it, that toy got from New York to Seattle without existing in the middle. And the message I sent, that part number, was meaningless to everybody. They just saw a number. They didn't know what it meant. Yet the de defining premise of the telecommunications industry is that everything passes through narrow pipes and there's a scarcity. If a whole telecommunication policy based on allocating scarcity, the purpose of the Federal Communications Commission is to manage the scarcity and also tell us what words you're allowed to use, but that's another topic. 
even well-meaning policies like network neutrality are about who decides on the scarcity. They all accept the scarcity. Yet that toy I sent was not the exception. That's the way the internet works. You don't send a copy of Wikipedia every time. You send a URL. You don't send a Netflix movie, you send a name. And it's the way people communicate. There's the old story of the codgers who told the same joke so many times. All they have to say is joke 17 and they laugh. <laughs> you know, it's all about shared context and that's the way things really work. So we need policies that basically embrace the new reality and the abundance. Because if we're not shipping things, between, we don't have scarcity in the wires. I'm not trying to fit that toy into a narrow wire. And are you, if we take what I did home networks, if you share with your neighbors, you, can, you expand the area of JustWorks connectivity without increasing the cost. And that's a path. You can take that to share an apartment house. You can take that to share in a city. But more important than it being about lowered cost is that with MB connect, when you plug something into your home network, the wired network, you don't think about it, you just plug it in and it just works. Imagine if anywhere you are, you can build connected devices, just like Tim Berners-Lee did the web. Let's say you want to do connected healthcare. Right now, this device could be a medical monitor, but a whole business would have to be developed to justify all the complexity of negotiating to get that message across. If you had ambient connectivity, you're gonna see a huge amount of innovation, healthcare, and anything else where you can just have this abundant resource, but more important, the opportunity to innovate. Now, I said this about software. It's not just about connectivity. If you think about it, when you ask for directions, you go to Google Maps and you want to take some trains and buses, you take it for granted that the GPS information is available for free. It's multi-billion dollars for the satellites, but it's free. The train schedules are available as a resource that anybody can build on. The weather is available. That's rich information that you can use to basically invent anything. This is not a smart city in the, ascent, in the classic sense, but a smart city is an idea based on you have to plan ahead, you have to build complex highways. This is an empowering city in which anybody can contribute value, and that's really the future. So I'd like you to join me in embracing ambient connectivity, and I put together a site for those who want more information. Right now, it's just a sign-up site. But think about, if you, right now we assume you have sidewalks as a basic resource. Imagine if you can assume connectivity anywhere. So I'd like you to join me in embracing a future of opportunity and a chance to discover what we can't yet imagine. Thank you.